podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect to them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Another episode of Barbless Podcast, episode four. I'm your host, Nick Hanna with River X Guide Service. I'm here with Chad Alderson with Barbless. And uh, we have some special guests uh, that work for Fish Bio, uh, Matt and Matt and Doug. And uh, we're excited to talk to them today a little bit about fishing and what they do. And I have some questions, and I'm sure Chad does as well. But before we get into it, I just uh, why don't you guys go ahead and just tell us a little bit about Fish Bio and what you guys do. And um, Yeah, all right. Well, it's great to be here. It's going to be a good time. Um, we're fisheries consulting. We do fish research, uh, monitoring, conservation, um, kind of in a nutshell. People, we always get asked the question a lot, like, you know, what do you guys do as fish biologists? How do you make a living? But in California these days, it's all about the water. Um, we manage fish populations to keep the water going. That's great. So you have projects throughout all of, all of California, Northern California? And even the world, right? Yeah, California, and we're really lucky. We get to do a lot of work in in Asia. So um, California gets a little bit old, same water politics, same issues, salmon, steelhead, delta smelt. But, you know, you get out to Asia, and it's a a whole different world out there. You were just in Vietnam, right? Yeah, Yeah. Vietnam, Laos, um, Thailand, and Cambodia is where the majority of our, our Asia work is. Wow. Yeah, I know. We're so lucky. <laughs> That's great. I feel that way because the our fisheries are right here in our backyard, and I get to, when I get off work, go go fishing for the evening. <laughs> yeah. Try, try to catch some striper and, or shad. Or, I know, but, but you, you deal with, you know, the same people and the same issues for 25 years, and it's like, right. you know, the last thing I want to do when I get off work is go fishing, number one, um, and just dealing with, you know, it's California. <laughs> so we get to, you know, go all over the world. It's fantastic. That's great. So, Doug, what's your role at Fish Bio? Um, one of the co-owners. So I went to Chico State um, way back in the day. You know, I grew up in San Jose and just wanted to get the heck out of the city. I got to Chico, and I'm like, this is, this is perfect. This is paradise. And I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. Um, got into a biology class and started working out of the Sacramento River at the Glen Cluse Irrigation District, the largest um, water diverter in Northern California. And... You know, I was in college, um, living in Chico, and I'm like, well, this is it. This is what I'm going to do for a living. I'm going to be a fish biologist. And uh, little did I know how that job would um, morph into what it's morphed in. But I um, started Fish Bio with my partner 10 years ago, and um, we're lucky we've got an office in Santa Cruz, our main office in Oakdale, Chico, and then in, in Laos in Southeast Asia. Cool. And then, um, you know, in terms of the locations, are, are there specializations for each one of your locations? Yeah, you know, our, our Central Valley, our, our Oakdale office, um, it's close to the San Joaquin Basin and the Delta. So that office gets to do a lot of field work. That's where we keep all of our equipment. I've got a big shop there, do a lot of fabrication. They build, you know, ladders and weirs and screens and video monitoring systems and things like that. Um, Chico is more... It's easier to recruit uh, masters and PhD level people to Chico because they look at this thing. Oh, I could, you know, who wouldn't want to live in Chico? Um, so we do a lot of more, a lot more desktop type modeling um, exercises here. And then Santa Cruz is kind of our conservation office. Um, people that live in Santa Cruz are attracted to Santa Cruz. Are big into to fisheries conservation. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So Matt, how about you? Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm a senior fisheries biologist um, at Fish Bio, and um, I'm in charge of a lot of the um, <clears throat> proposal writing and um, 
day-to-day operations of um, data analysis and uh, report writing and uh, been here about five years now and uh, Matt's like the best fisheries biologist in California too by the way he's he's just too humble Uh, that's his main weakness he's got it going on I I, like I said in 25 years I've worked with a lot of people and Matt as a person is number one and as a biologist he's he's just what about a fisherman, an angler? Yeah, yeah. that's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a steelhead, steelhead road sign over his door. I don't think he can so. fish at all. <laughs> that was Doug's old sign. That's Doug's. Yeah. I stole took my it. office. You can you believe that? He would steal my office. Yeah. So I, uh, my background in fisheries goes back to uh, fishing with my dad um, in Northern California and uh, just growing up doing that and um, just kind of stumbled my way into into this field. Um, I guided for a while up in Mount Shasta um, on McLeod and Upper Sack, a little on the pit. Very um, cool. <clears throat> and then uh, eventually transitioned into um, Humboldt State, uh, where I got my bachelor's and master's in fisheries. And that was, again, um, primarily a fishing decision uh, because there's <laughs> Chasing better, steelhead better over there steelhead the coast. fishing over there. So. You didn't know at the time when you get to be a fish biologist, you don't actually fish. I mean, that kind of always seems to, you know, be the first thing that goes. You don't you know. I think it's you, when you get older, you just make there's less time to fish. And then when you're in fisheries, too, I think there's something about like, I don't know. Is it just me or is that the case? No, it's me, too. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, what, what? What? Do you have any questions, Chad? As far as to start a topic off? Um, no, you go ahead. Well, um, obviously, that um, we've had some crazy weather this last few months, and it's affected a lot of the fisheries all over the state. With the Feather River being right at the heart of mm-hmm. it all, and dealing with the dam and everything like that, and that was one of my my first questions is, you know, what kind of impact do you guys see with, with that dam and the high water releases and how the fishery is going to respond, respond to it? So in, in general, um, high water in California is, uh, is typically a good thing for fish. Um, yeah. it opens up a lot more habitat, um, floodplain habitat. Um, it, in the Delta, there was historically a, a wide expanse of open shallow water and, um, all sorts of native fish um, benefited from that, the seasonal flooding. Um, so in general, high water typically produces, you know, in the falling year, typically produces more fish and um, fish in better condition yeah. as well. That's um, one of the things, too. And this is what we're lucky. We get to bring our international experience because um, this, this was a point that driven home to me when we started working in Asia where you've got these – vast floodplains and you've got like the Mekong River um, over a thousand species and I you know in California um, 20 something um, not very many um, yeah, probably more like in the in the in Delta the, maybe yeah. 30 35 35 yeah. um, versus you know over a thousand in the Mekong Basin and then just the productivity the biomass that comes out of a system like that and when you look at why that's the case you know, they get those high flows in the floodplain. They get all this floodplain habitat and the fish. They do fantastic. It's good, warm, shallow water, lots of food production. Right. And, right. you know, we so see all the same thing. So floodplains are throwing off bugs left and right. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's great for fish. Yeah, I know that um, just historically after the 90s, uh, the ni- you know, 97 flood and all the rain that we got then, you know, we saw some great and phenomenal fishing in the high flow of the Feather River just with the steelhead and the return numbers. So do you, do you think it's the following year it's going to bounce right back or is it going to take time? I mean, yeah. do you guys... I don't know. I mean, it, it depends really <laughs> on a lot changed. of things. Right. Um, you know, if, <clears throat> if everything lines up, say, you know, we have these high flows this year. Um, Consistently, you, mo- yeah. You get a lot of fish out to the ocean right. where then there's good ocean conditions then you'd expect generally like in a couple of years we'd have some pretty good returns and it's it's the pfmc just issued a report i don't know a couple weeks ago on um the number of salmon in the ocean um, that were produced last couple of years the number of salmon that are available for harvest Mm -hmm. and what this forecast what the season is going to look like because they use this to to set the limits for this year and sure I think it was 200, 250,000 fish available for harvest, which is just, it's not an all-time low, but it's its really, really low. So right. this is going to be a bad commercial season and sports season in the ocean, and then we probably will get less than 100,000 fish back to, to fresh water. So that's directly correlated basically to our ten, the drought we just experienced, yeah, probably, yeah. right? But it's also weird because it is, I think it's a, a result of the drought, but 
the last couple of years, fishing game has been pumping out the hatchery fish, um, you know, over 30, maybe 40 million juvenile hatchery fish every year. And because of the in-river survival problems that are, you know, last couple of years exacerbated by the drought, but also um, predation predators are a big problem. So they put them down in the bay. And when they put them down in the bay, they survive really well. We don't have the mortality in river. So they skip the gauntlet, basically. They skip the gauntlet. Yeah. And that's why you would expect that there would be a lot of fish out there in the ocean available, you know, ready to come back. But that's just not the not the case this year. So it's interesting. So that and that's that brings up another point is um, the stripers have been hit hard in the last year and the cause for this the low counts of salmon oh. and and obviously uh everybody has their own opinion and when you're mm-hmm. fly fishing you know opinion becomes close to f- <laughs> fact at some points but what um i mean low water lots of stripers still in the system obviously that had a pretty big impact uh, on those fish i would assume i mean the the trouble with um you know fisheries in the delta and california in general it's complicated and it doesn't right. usually boil down to just one, one thing. thing um Humans, and all these things ag, all these things are acting drought, in unison predators to, yep. yeah it's and basically the last few years have been almost a perfect storm for uh, you know basically against salmon and right. so that's going to stack the deck against them i saw and, s- something on your guys website uh pre- pre- predation uh detection acoustic tags yeah yeah is that that's something you guys developed or no that's high tech stuff that's way be way beyond us yeah Um, we it's i thought that was pretty interesting though to to and that has i mean that's kind of going to be used for that type what we're talking about right yeah so um that that kind of came out of some studies um about five or six years ago uh, maybe a little bit longer than that um where salmon were acoustically tagged um and they were having trouble um the salmon would move downstream and actually be consumed by a predatory fish, striped bass, largemouth bass, uh, other predators as well. Um, and that predation event would um, essentially confound any of the results that they'd get from those survival studies. And so a couple of different companies have come up with this tag that um, when preyed upon, the tag that was originally implanted in the salmon um, will change its um, signal, basically, mm-hmm. and then uh, basically tell the network of listening receivers, acoustic receivers, that, in fact, that tag has been preyed upon. Wow. Um, and then so they then they can remove that fish out of the pool. And of, so I guess the million-dollar question is how the hell did they do that? <laughs> uh, just a digestible fuse. Based on the enzyme in the stomach, yeah. right, that, yeah, that, would trigger, yeah. that would trigger it? That's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think that's what pretty a really neat idea. What do the tags cost a, a piece? That, that's my next question. Uh, I would say ballpark <laughs> six, 600. Yeah, because yeah, I think I, I'm going to put one in my in my uh, ice cream in my freezer so I know if my wife is, is uh, hammering it when I'm not looking. You know what's weird, though? Everybody, is, you know, they don't know what you do in fish. It's like, what, what do you possibly do? And we were talking about a study where, you know, we implanted – um, transmitters, radio transmitters in baby salmon. And, you know, you got to go surgically cut the fish open, put a $500 transmitter in it, you know, suture the fish closed and let them go. And you're doing that to maybe a couple of thousand fish. And then those tags will only last for 30 days. Um, the money that's spent on research in, in, well, California, the Central Valley, but also the Columbia system for salmon is just insane. It's, it's total big business. And it's, it's all about the water. So this new method is, is kind of the replacement? You know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a replacement. I think it's, um, it'll be able to refine the estimates from the, the typical um, studies that they do. Predation is a focus now. They want to really get a handle on, and on how bad it is. And with the older technology, it was just difficult. We knew the fish were being lost, but um, the exact cause is difficult. To tell. Well, well, they've been here, you know, they planted them from the East Coast in the late 1800s. And in just a couple decades, it was a commercial fishery. It just exploded. Yeah. And for the last hundred years, you've never, I mean, I've been that here that long, but you haven't really heard of stripers or largemouth bass, bass being a cause of that. So it's just interesting that it's all of a sudden coming about and yeah. I think you guys touched on it a minute ago. It was, it's kind of critical mass, everything, you know, more people and more water being diverted and just, you know, right. it's, it's um, you know, the Delta uh, Central Valley fish populations are continually declining for for a lot of reasons. Um, 
I do, we do know from sampling that's been done in the Delta that non-native fish populations are increasing in numbers um, and, and abundance while, while natives are, are, decreasing. are decreasing. A lot of people mm. think stripers, you know, not so much or they've been, been um, declining. But I think, if anything, they've probably been staying the same. I don't think we've seen large declines in striper. There's there's been some evidence that maybe they've declined in the last in the early 2000s. They're part yeah. part of the pod group. Um, oh yeah. And so those they're pelagic organisms. And um, what does pelagic mean? Pelagic uh, means oriented towards the surface of the water. So okay. Up in the upper water column. So uh, things like delta smelt, long fin smelt, striped bass, juvenile striped bass uh, are in that group. And um, those have uh, severely declined in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. But that's one of the keys with predation we've learned in the last couple of years, too. Because, you know, 10 years ago, we really weren't monitoring or, or researching predation. I don't think anybody believed. I, You know, being in the middle of it, I would have never believed that predation was as bad as it is. And one of the things we've learned is it's the juveniles, um, the juvenile stripers. When you see those big, giant stripers, you're like, oh, my God, think about how many fish it can eat. But, you know, for every 30-pound striper, there's probably 100 two-year-old or right. one-year-old fish right. and those small fish you know can really really take their toll you bring up an interesting point because a lot of the big striper i've caught i always will go in and look see what they've been eating yeah. and i've never seen a baby trout or you know what, salmon in their stomach you know i have i have seen um uh, baby shad and um you know different bass yeah. species but never seen a trout and pike minnows and yeah. pike minnows are a species that i think will eat more fry and eggs on for salmon and steelhead than the stripers ever will. But I do agree with you on that smaller, yeah. the smaller striper being more of an influence big, on the, on big them. fish, um, eat big fish. Right. And we've caught stripers literally electroshocked them. So, you know, you put electricity in the water and they, yeah. they get stunned and you, you net them up that, um, had fish hanging out, or I shouldn't say, well, a fish hanging out of its mouth, a stripe or um, a Sacramento sucker. Um, so the sucker was literally being digested, um, you know, just, it was, it was too big to fit in the stomach. It was just, right. just incredible. I think they should lower that slot limit for those small yeah. stripers just because of that. There are so many, and I, th- I, th- I think it would help. Yeah. They're just doing and more damage than, they're, than yeah. the big guys. And they're the best, I think they're, they're the best to eat. Right? If you're going to eat a striper, don't <laughs> want, eat one of those old ones, man. <laughs> right. Unless you like mercury and toxins. Right. <laughs> would you drink Delta water? Why would you eat a Delta fish? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. It's a great point. <laughs> hey, so, so, Matt, you're an angler also. Um, you know, being a fish biologist, what have you leveraged from that discipline that would apply to, to fishing in general? Um. Probably the biggest thing is um, looking at um, where fish are in the river. Um, I read a lot of papers. I, you know, figure out where fish might be based on cover, based on depth, based on um, uh, water temperature. And so that's allowed me to hone in a little bit better how I fish and how I kind of target places to fish. Can you kind of break that down a little for us? Mm Hmm. I would like to know because I'm still learning. I've only been doing this for about a year. It's a good point because I, we obviously we see everything from above the water, right? But when you start analyzing things and and it's a whole nother world down there. Yeah, you know? I guess. Are you so when you when you think about you know the 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 topology of the river is what you're focused on? Or are you thinking about underneath mostly habitat wise <clears throat> and where they might be more laying? more more habitat wise? I mean, generally like fish like certain things like certain substrates, certain flow. Uh, flow type certain lanes in the river and I think um, doing some of the research I've done I've been able to pinpoint where fish uh, might be a little bit better don't uh, you think that the best thing any angler could do would be to snorkel to like actually I get in just the water going to say that yeah. I, I didn't want to say it because I don't want people <laughs> being, doing being it. a better angler but yeah. no honestly it's if you want to be a better fisherman, go snorkel a river. Yeah, One of your Nick has rivers. done it. Nick's, yeah. I've heard, yeah, he's done and it. So it taught me a lot. He's, and, he's crazy. And it's how, fascinating. How yeah. fragile and when those fish are eating, you know, they'll suck a fly in, yeah. and you won't. Even, you're nothing will move. You won't feel it. You won't see your indicator. 
I mean, other than it being a dry fly, you don't know that it just happened. And, you know, and, we always think, too, as anglers that, that fish are really skittish. But when you get in there and you're observing them and you see that, like, they don't even bother. They'll keep feeding. And, yeah, yeah. you know, mm. times we go disturb the gravel and kick up some food. That's and there they are the fish, right? Yeah, yeah. And right next to you. Yeah. They don't care. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, to, to your point about them being spooky, maybe it's a misnomer, but they everything i read it's like you gotta you gotta creep up on them you you don't want to wear high contrast clothing all this all this other stuff but it sounds like what i'm hearing that's not really that important yeah i think it depends on the species where you're at all kinds of things new zealand it doesn't work once you spook that fish or trout it's, it's gone it's gone you yeah. can have a chance to catch it again that's but, true yeah but here it's a little bit different they're they're not really like that you got a good imitation and a good presentation and i think that's probably right probably the key but i think getting in water you know even scuba diving if you've ever been scuba diving when it's a whole nother world mm-hmm. underwater that we're just clueless about yep um so yeah it's key hmm. yeah there's a there's an instagram account i think it's called river snorkeling and that's what those guys do so they do underwater survey and they post all their stuff it's it's pretty cool hmm. i'm waiting we'll, till we'll put a link to it in the show notes Google Maps will have Google underwater soon, and then we can all right. just kind of go on a computer and check out the fish habitat well, before we go fishing. I, I actually, I've, I've been thinking about, I've got the new the Hero Session GoPro. It's like this little square, mm-hmm. and I want to get one of the, you know, the water weenies that you get in the, the pool with. And the noodle? And cut, like yeah, noodle. the noodle, but cut like a six-inch piece and put PVC pipe through the center of it. And then hang that GoPro like a mallet underneath it, so it's it's you know it's weighted from the bottom, and just throw that sucker up top and let it float through right back to you, and yeah, might work, right? Yeah, they're yeah. coming out with a lot of underwater drones now too. I know, that, I just want, like yeah. a, just like the yeah. drone you have yeah. at Mavic, but yeah, we've been using the we've been using the D- DJI Mavic to do aerial survey of water. It's just so great because it's tiny. You throw it in the backpack. You walk out to water and like if you know if there's a bend to your right and to your left, you just throw it up in the air, take a look at which way it's going and what the what the conditions are, and you uh-huh. decide to go left or right. How do we live without drones, dude? God, isn't that insane? <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're now just getting to the point. The Mavic's I've had four, and the Mavic is finally one that's useful because it's big enough, it's small enough to fit in your pack. Like I put it in just a, a hip pack. And it's light, and it and the technology is great. Technology sick, yeah, yeah. And then you get to show people. That's the key, and what we found in research. I think that there's one thing that we've done well that's led to um, part of our success over the last decade. It's bringing people, um, you know, simplify things to pictures, pictures and video. You know, research doesn't make it to the average person because you know it's published in journals and it's it's difficult to read and it's boring and. You bring people back a couple of pictures and a blog post or some video clip, um, you know, I think it just makes all the difference in the world. Um, so that's one of the things when we do research projects, um, we strive or, or Matt strives to, to publish in, in peer reviewed journals, but making things available in a real time to, to average people um, like myself, it just, it makes all the difference. Yeah, in the I mean, world. we're, we're visual learners, you know, yeah. so that's, that's kind of that. Yeah. That lines up. You guys have a great website with all those stories that you have in there yeah. and the data that you bring to it. I think it's uh, it's great. Yeah, what's thank the you. what's the it's fishbio.com. Fishbio.com and the key with what's so cool about our website because people do love it and we do a lot of you know they post a lot of videos. We've got a videographer, um, D and our communications director Aaron. Um, just fantastic stuff. Um, but we make it available. Um, to everyone and put it on the website and it's just you know um it's the way we communicate um not only with our clients but but with the general public mm-hmm. um and it's just worked out really really well for us um everybody everybody seems to respond well wow so what what projects are you guys working on right now that you can talk about <laughs> yeah i know Matt. that we can talk about <laughs> 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 um well um Doug has been doing this for uh, 20 years, 25, 20. And uh, <clears throat> in that, in that he's uh, been part of a lot of different projects that have collected data for 20 years sometimes. And um, a big part of the push for me um, in the last year or two is actually um, going through all that data and, and seeing what some of the long-term patterns in the data says, um, you know, how, how well are fish doing, um, has their 
size changed over the over the years. Um, and I was just earlier today looking at some of that from uh, one of our rotary screw traps from the Stanislaus River. Um, and uh, yeah, so just uh, trying to tease apart, um, you know, how, how the fish are doing long term and then, you know, kind of what habitat conditions or environmental conditions are important to those fish and how they might, uh, you know, benefit them or harm them. Causes for decline. That's kind of an ongoing thing that I think Matt's always looking at. It's like, you know, everybody wants to know the same things. Why are fish populations in decline? Not and go figure because, you know, um, just increased demand for resources. And as we talked about predation, what, 73 percent of um, uh, the non-native fish that we have were intentionally planted by state and federal agencies going back to you know, stripers way back in the day. Yeah, I just um, learned about the stripers were only in the Atlantic, I guess. Is that yeah. right? Yep. And, the, and they brought, did they bring them over in the late 1800s? Or yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, an incredible crazy. story, too, the when you go back and read the Livingston Stone accounts and, and how they did it. This is, yeah, it's fascinating. They, they brought, and you could see why they did it back in the day. Um, you know, they wanted sport fish, but more than sport fish, it was about food, right? right, that's, right. We got these big fish, let's, and that's, you thought you were doing the environment a favor by, by bringing in, you know, and uh, putting new fish in. So we yeah, brought more stuff to catch. Yeah, yeah, we brought the big fish in, and then the, I think the, probably the fatal mistake was then we brought in the small fish, the bait fish. You know, it's like, oh, we brought these, we stocked these big fish, now they need something to eat, so let's bring in the little fish so they have something to eat. And so we, you know, unintentionally stalked all the predators and then the, the competitors. What about otters? I'm always surprised that they're such good fishermen. <laughs> they're Nick, really Nick, Nick doesn't yeah. like otters. He's got an interesting uh, theory about otters. Yeah. <laughs> well, in low water especially, I mean, I think they can do some damage to a fishery. I've I, seen them. I've seen, like, beautiful steelhead on the bank with otters. It, it just blows me away that they're that effective. They're just hanging out on the side? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they had caught a fish, and then it had dragged yeah, it to the yeah. bank, and then it was it was yeah. eating it. But it's just it's like, you know, 16, 18 inch steelhead, an otter. Well, it just it just came to my mind because everybody's talking about you know ag and humans and stripers. Yeah. What about the what about the otters? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, when the system's out of balance, it's like we see this on the Columbia, and you mentioned pike minnow. Certainly, you know, our 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 native pike minnow are a problem when you alter the course of water and you put in. You know, dams and irrigation structures and bridges and things like that. You're just, you know, creating potential um, predation problems. So it's, you know, it's the, the combined effect. Um, so we're always going to be looking. You know, the issues I think, unfortunately, the Delta haven't changed that. Or in California, haven't changed that substantially. Um, internationally, a lot of work. Um, kind of cool establishing fish conservation zones, freshwater fish conservation zones. It's, you know, go figure. Um, in California, we, you know, we, we came in, we modified all our waterways, built dams, important for our economic development. Um, but now the reason we have so much work in Southeast Asia is they're doing the exact same thing. Mm. And you want to stop them and say, hey, you know, wait, 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 yeah. learn from our mistakes. Um, and that's actually why we're there. We can, we've studied um, the impacts of dams and water diversions for a long time so we can, we can help them. But they're facing the same issue, like they want economic prosperity you know and mm -hmm. they can do that by putting in a dam and selling the hydropower the problem there is tens of millions of people live on their fishery our fisheries have always been you know sport a little bit of food but we don't depend on them for for our sustenance and in the mekong that's that's the case there so when mm -hmm. you look at the impacts of declining fisheries you know to them you're talking about Big deal. It's it's a big deal. You're talking about livelihoods, and these are people that just you know they don't have any money, so it's not like they could just like, you know, go to the store and and buy fish rather than catch fish. Well, a lot of these dams too in California were set up, you know, obviously years ago, and the technology has got to be so much better now. Is that something? Is that what you're teaching over there? Is to enforce a better tech. A plan that has better technology when incorporated, you, and fish how would that in how would that work? Yeah. How would that work here? Yeah. Is if you were to do it all over again, and I think probably the key is probably planning for location, because obviously if you don't put a fish ladder in, um, that's a problem for any fish that are migratory. Um, fish passage has improved um, a little bit, maybe a lot over the last few decades, but you go someplace like the Mekong where you've got species that are unidentified, you don't even know about them yet, how do you build a passage facility for them? Or you've got to build a passage facility that supports, you know, um, 
10 foot long right. Mekong giant catfish <laughs> and then puffer what? fish, a freshwater puffer oh, there's, fish. Yeah, there's, there's a 10 foot catfish out there? Oh, God, yeah. Bigger than that. I was watching River uh, Monsters they, and the guy's like sticking his leg down the hole and then he's bringing right? up the catfish. That sounds like a pinner compared to a 10 foot catfish. <laughs> it's like you just put your whole body it's in insane. it. insane. <laughs> you want to think that, you know, Holy puffer crap. fish, you get fresh water. The biodiversity there is just, and that's the thing, it's you know. Killer. We were talking, what, 30, 35 species in, in California in the Delta, and I, you know, identifying those would be a challenge for me because I don't spend every day in the field anymore. But when you think about how many people out there can identify a thousand species in the Mekong, um, so it must you must have a good time going out there. Oh, we it's have kind the best of like time. a you know, it's like a jack in the box every time you pull something, it's new. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just you know, it's it's the food and it's the region and it's just it's the Mekong. It's exotic and um, forget the fact that you know the fisheries biology is incredible because you know you're out in the uh, middle of nowhere, you know. Some of our staff did a, a, a backpacking trip in Myanmar. You know, who gets to go? Um, there's a handful of fisheries biologists in the world that have, you know, hiked in the remote areas of Myanmar to look for new species. That's that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's a bucket list item, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah that's definitely. That's very cool. And are, so is the government hiring you guys to do this stuff? Mostly, mostly, um, it's interesting. Conservation groups, mostly. It's it's weird because in in California, most of our work comes from um, the private industry, hydropower, um, irrigation, cities and counties. I mean, we work for Army Corps of Engineers and some other government agencies as well. But it's it's private money. Internationally, it's the um, WWF and Conservation International and IUCN. It's a big worldwide conservation groups because they're the ones that are most concerned about the international issues the foreign governments you know they're the ones actually benefiting from the sale of the the hydropower so they're pro hydropower and others are pro i wouldn't say they're anti hydropower but it's a matter of they recognize let's do the smart if you if you plan and if there's one thing we could do different in california it would probably be a little bit better placement a little more judicious development we could do it over again Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. do do you do you feel like there's a better equilibrium in in these in asia in terms of industry versus you know the the people that are you know getting sustenance off the river because of that relationship and versus california where no one really gets their sustenance off the river other than guides and whoever lives directly on the no river. because in asia it's still about you know the government is going to do what the government wants to do i think right. the people are poorly poorly represented and that's why the international environmental groups are really critical to the process right now because they're the ones that are standing up for the people and saying hey you know we understand this benefits everybody but let's make sure this is done in an appropriate manner and you know that makes good sense why not take everything that we've learned in the united states for the last you know three or four decades and use that in in planning elsewhere around the world and it's kind of hard you know i hate to go and give them a value judgment and be the outsider that walks into their um, their countries and says you know oh don't build that dam no 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 let's let's protect your fish we've cut down all of our forests and um, we've dammed all of our rivers and then you know i'm going to walk into another country and say no don't do that it's like you know it just seems a little bit a little bit hypocritical yeah I think it's, it, it, it's tough man it, it's like you know we're, we're posting to industrialized and there's a lot of third world countries that really as, aspire to push past that point and those are some of the trade-offs i think the the good thing is because we've kind of snow plowed or forged this ground to begin with we can you know they can skip pulling you know electricity or or cellular you know just telecoms infrastructure right it's put a cell tower up now yeah. we had to pull we had to put you know stakes in the ground and wire everything so there's some technological benefits that they get and somehow they don't get locked into a hundred dollar a month phone plans yeah, either right. they buy you know they're like paying a few dollars yeah. and they're getting their cell phone coverage it's like i'm envious when i go there what they pay for their cell phone it's yeah. practically free and it's 5g <laughs> Right. <laughs> Better quality, mm-hmm. less money. So one of the so like the Shasta Dam, for example, has what that I think you see one of the best fisheries directly below the Shasta Dam with cold water release, the bug life, the trout life. The lower sack is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, I, I know there's some other 
examples that maybe go a, a different way, but there's some new talk about dam development on the e- east side of the river or west side of the river, right? What's the, isn't the, are you guys familiar with that? Are you talking sites? Reservoir? Yeah. Yeah. Sites. Sites. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I, I've just always, or, or I, sites reservoir, I feel I like know. there's so many little tributaries that come into the sack there that aren't, even, that don't even exist anymore because water's been taken out of them before they even get there. And they've just, they get really warm. But there's an opportunity there to create a fishery, almost like build a dam up in that canyon where really nothing hmm. survives, you know. But um, I don't know. Does it, am yeah. I? Does that make sense at all? Because I, I don't feel know. like it's like there's yeah. some fisheries that are doing really well, like right below Shasta Dam. And if we could do something like that, would that does that make sense? Tailwater. Or? I mean, obviously tailwater fisheries. There's there's a lot of them, and that's a good opportunity. But if it's it's not really, I don't know if it'd be a good reason to build you know a dam or more storage. I think if there's one thing that is probably problematic from the drought, it's now that there's a push for for more storage. And I just don't see that more storage is the the long term solution for our our water and our our fisheries problems. It seems like. What you don't hear people talking about is more conservation, right. you know, real conservation, because right. that's really what's going to make a make a difference, especially as the population of California continues to to grow. Um, so, yeah, storage, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like right. the, the future. Yeah. I mm. know that, you know, ag community doesn't like to hear that. Um, but, you know, it, it is what it is. Water is a total... Water, and that's the people, when, when people ask us again, going back to what we do, people don't understand the, that, you know, we have water issues in California. What? You, you manage water, you manage, it's like people are still um, somewhat clueless about the importance of, of water and what it costs us, the government, um, on an annual basis to manage. Um, it's right. insane. The fisheries biology is like an industry these days and for every fisheries biologist we go to a meeting and there's you know five attorneys and five other consultants so we're kind of the 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 tip of the iceberg but it takes a lot of people these days and a lot of money to to manage water and fish in california Hmm. that's a good point Hmm. so can you guys what do you guys do at the fab lab that sounds like um you know the the uh Skywalker Ranch for yeah. for making a it's like what sci-fi don't we films. do at the Fab Lab? Um, and I, I am kind of jealous of our Oakdale office because they they do so many cool things. Um, it's we do a lot of fabrication for fishery stuff, and you name it, our guys can make it. This you know the conference table. Um, yeah, this con- let's let's just talk about this conference <laughs> table for one second because I oh, like, it'll be in the show notes. <laughs> but it's like this uh, you know cement substrate, and then it's got steel a steel base with fish welded into it it's it's a very fishy conference the table, logo into way. the middle of it too our, yeah our, it's our logo so they made this we make we try and do everything in-house um we try and um we uh we like to keep you know we find good people and we like to keep them around and so when regular work slows down at times in the summertime or whenever you know we spend um, rather than buy things like this we, we make them we can make things better than we can buy um We've got a, a wet lab, so probably about a, a 7,000 gallon um, indoor system that we can um, uh, rear fish in and do experiments. You know, we were talking about tags earlier. We can surgically implant tags and look at the um, impacts of the, the tags on fish behavior and, and, and mortality. Um, we've got a garden. It's not related to fisheries, but we've got a couple of acres, so it's really cool. Over 100 fruit trees. We um, over what 30 40 50 varieties of, of hot peppers we make our own hot sauces oh that's cool is um, that stuff you can buy or is that just it's all just for us us and our oh, friends okay. and our, our clients yeah very cool we do our own beer so we've got a, a brew lab um uh, what is it a two barrel system and this is so, all at the oakdale all at the location. oakdale office i know we have to get down there and check that out i know see in here in chico we can we don't need to attract people we've got we've got chico in oakdale we have to have a, a brewery and a um, wet lab and a garden to get people to move down Is there, there. a water slide or no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's next. Um, There's chickens, too. Chickens. That's right. God, our chickens are fantastic. Um, yeah. So they, um, like I said, you know, small fish screens. We don't do the, the big, large diversions, but um, sampling devices, underwater um, video monitoring systems, 
Um, anything out of, out of metal, our, our metal fabricators are incredible. So with the, the underwater systems, like what kind of, what kind of data can you collect with something like that? Turbidities, yeah. obviously, and CFS, I assume. That's always, yeah. Turbidity is always a problem. Um, you know, the problem with fish is just that the, they live in water, and it's a pain in the butt. To, it's difficult to monitor animals that live in water. You know, when you think of a biologist, if you're a mammal biologist or an avian biologist, it's it's fairly easy to go out and, and monitor and, and, and count. But when you got to count the number of animals in water, um, it's it's a pain, and knowing the population of animals is the first key to manage them. And you know how do you how do you manage for salmon or steelhead or delta smelt if you don't know how many there are every year? It's important to know how many there are every year, and then you correlate that to different environmental variables, and you can hopefully figure out what's driving the population um, up or down. So a lot of the work that we do is just counting fish as accurately as possible um, whether it's using matt mentioned earlier a rotary screw trap a device that floats mm-hmm. at the surface and just monitors baby fish as they move downstream mm-hmm. um, our video monitoring systems simple um, have a couple three or four or five cameras inserted into them you put them in a fish ladder it's all kind of seamless and it's motion triggered so when a fish moves upstream in the ladder video system turns on captures an image of the fish um, we do that over the course of the season. We know how many fish moved upstream, what time of year they moved upstream, and then we can usually guess, you know, was it due to flow? Was it due to turbidity, temperature? Um, you figure those things out, and you can you can manage your, your fish population so it's much a, better. So it's basically like a wildlife camera trap, yeah. but it's underneath the water. Is that a newer yeah. technology? Because, I mean, some of that sonar, orient, right? You guys are yep. using sonar to do that? I mean, that's... Yep. Can't be cheap Sonar, equipment. No, right? God, we use this um, device, a Rack, Vaki River Watcher. It comes from Iceland. Um, it's almost about a hundred thousand. Is that um, the same one, Darren? Uh, they have a portable. They using? have a portable version of that that they have mounted on their boat that they use to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it looked like yeah, the, yeah. the imagery coming off of it looked like a sonogram. Basically. Yeah, that's the Eris. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what he yeah, said. Yeah. Eris. Yeah. 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 Matt, he was just out doing that last week. Yep. Sonar camera. Yeah, yeah, those things are killer. Like yeah. you can see the bow and the fish as it's swimming yeah. by. Well, you can see we were talking about the predation tags. The, the Vaki is an um, underwater infrared fish counter. And then the Eris, that's a $100,000 video camera too. You can see the money that gets put into right. technology mm-hmm. for for fisheries research. But that's, because of turbidity, you mentioned that being the biggest problem. That's yeah. where those mm-hmm. things excel and, yep. and yeah. help you guys the most. They can punch through the fog, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the key is, and this is... You know, it's key for long-term management in California. Um, um, Environmental monitoring, river temperatures, you know, flow, elevation stage, discharge, whatever you're looking at, um, and then fish populations, um, especially if they're migratory, you know, how many are moving upstream and why. And when I go back 25 years ago to when I started at Chico State, we didn't know. I mean, the there's so little information. It's interesting that to think that I go from Chico State to 25 years later, you know, we've made some discoveries in the San Joaquin Sacramento basins that I was taught completely different. Stripers was mm-hmm. one of the things we were taught. Stripers didn't live in um, freshwater year round. They were migratory, and they only right. came into the system to spawn. And now, it's like there are two whatever. species. There's the ones that go. There are right. anadromous that go from the ocean and back, yeah. and then the ones that said, "Hey, there's plenty of food here. I'm just going to hang out and, and yeah. enjoy the Sacramento River up here in Chico and eat pike minnows." And but are they <laughs> right? Are the ones that that stick up in the the freshwater are they can't go into salt water? Is that the species no. difference? But nope. they, they can. They can. They yeah. just choose to yeah. chill. Give them another couple thousand years they might be different species Uh, they'll probably be hunting with bows by then (laughs) (laughs) yeah but it's just incredible to think that you know 25 years we've made some remarkable remarkable discoveries in california Hmm. that's really neat what's some of the biggest tech technology innovation you guys have seen in the last like four years and and i want to get to artificial intelligence also because if you guys are dealing with data at some point you know you're coming through uh, a pile of data AI's in there somewhere but let's start with the first question I don't know what do you think yeah hopefully I don't lose my job I just heard the <laughs> NPR article about the r- robot proof jobs or algorithm proof jobs but uh no I it's definitely uh yeah using something like machine learning um definitely would be 
Um, I, I don't have any experience doing it, but it might be something that we could get into. At some I know point. a data scientist I can hook you guys up with in, in <laughs> L.A. <laughs> no, I got to keep my job. He's very good. <laughs> he'll, 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 he can help you guys. Yeah, but no, there's there's definitely um, there's definitely some tools you can use to to better um, go through the data and, and find stuff that you know I'm not particularly trained to see, but like a machine might be able to or an algorithm might be able to to detect. You know what's interesting about the technology though, because we have clients that come to us again on the private side. And they'll say, oh, we've got an urgent problem and, you know, whatever it takes. Now, when something gets to be urgent, you know, they've got money to spend. So it's like, oh, you know, let's find one of these acoustic tags or predator tags or whatever. You know, money's no option. You know, we'll spend a hundred, we'll spend a million dollars. And it's like, well, actually, you know, we told you 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, if you would start monitoring the population um, and spend, say, $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year for 10 or 20 years, you'd be way farther ahead than you are now when you're looking for, you know, that quick fix or that magical answer, the silver bullet type thing. Um, And that's, I think, one of the key things that we still need to focus on California, probably everywhere with environmental monitoring. Long-term is the key, having good, solid, long-term data sets. And a lot of people, you know, it's boring to people. Like, well, why do we want to spend this money monitoring fish populations, you know, in five years? You don't see much in 10 years, but when you get 15, 20, 30 years out, I mean, you know, Matt's working with data sets now. What's that Delta stuff you were looking at? 41 years. Right? Um, and if 41 years ago they would have done a better job, and, and certainly I'm not blaming them because they, they didn't know, but if 41 years ago we would have set up real um, thorough monitoring systems throughout, you know, the state, we'd be we'd be much farther ahead than we are today. I want my kid to catch a 10 pound cromer like, like I get a chance to do, you know, and I think that's, I think that's important. And that's what it's, what it's all about. Right. Yeah. I mean, generations yeah. down the road. Yeah. We were, that's something we were talking about though recently. It's like people, you know, you look at fishing license sales, um, fishing game, the license sales have been declining, you know, every year they get more expensive every year and the number of sales goes down every year. Um, and I just don't think that people, if you're not, if you don't grow up in the outdoors, if you're not taught to fish or to go backpacking right. or to go hiking, you don't. It's not a value that you have. And I've been surprised in the the decline in, in angling and, and sportsmanship in general that I've seen mm-hmm. during during my career. Um, you know, a lot fewer people I think fly fishermen and, and fishermen in general. And you know, if kids aren't exposed to it. It's not a value. And the state manages our waters as largely a, a put and take fishery, and you know it's not really an environmental or outdoor experience when you're going to stop at a right. parking lot and you know walk 15 feet and put a salmon egg on your line and you know catch a hatchery fish. Yeah, hence, I mean, hence this podcast and the yeah, name Barbless. Yeah, I was just about to say that's, why, that's <laughs> one of the reasons why we started doing this was you know there's a lot of people in the Bay Area. Like I worked at eBay for a while, and um, there's a lot of people in the Bay that just don't understand that you know three hours away they can have the solitude of a stream yeah. and, you know, have a good time and take their kid and really get into it and, and experience new stuff. Get them off the iPhone and, and, the and technology. part of me doesn't want them to know. It's right. like, you know, because right. then when you go and you see the garbage and the junk and you see the, you yeah. know, yeah, well, the that, I think that's, yeah. And that's I not, mean, you just got to educate. And that's and, the key. You yeah. know, and, yeah. If they, if people don't go, they're not going to learn and they're not going to protect. Um, and right. at this point, we, we have to protect what what we've yeah. got. We've got to do a better job of managing it, especially, you know, we've been talking largely um, salmon, um, but the when you go upstream of the dams, our, our, our trout streams, you know, that's where my, that's what got me started in this is, you know, I was backpacking when I was a kid and um, learning to fish, fish for trout um, in the high mountains. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, yeah. I, and I couldn't, you know, when I think about being out on the boat, striper fishing, it's like, gee, would I rather be striper fishing in the Delta or would I rather be up, you know, 8,000 yeah. feet yeah. catching a small trout? I just went, uh, uh, took the jet boat on the sack and went up one of our tributaries and right at the mouth of, you know, a couple hundred yards up, there was a log jam and it was full of 40 bottles and backpacks <laughs> and flip flops and oh, the river got an enema this year so i bet it, a lot of that stuff was just pegged it was sides. it was yeah. stacked full i mean it, I, I felt like going back with my boat and just filling it i mean i could have literally yeah. filled it up yeah. with all the trash that had floated down from yeah the high water the spring yeah i think hogan brown pulled out like 
a couple hundred pounds of garbage off the Yuba. Really? Yeah, about yeah. three three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what's got to change. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, you gotta it's you gotta teach people different values. And how do you you know how do you teach people don't different litter. values when you hey don't litter right? right. Like, <laughs> here's a, here's an idea. But when you don't grow litter. up a concrete jungle, you yeah. know it's like yeah. littering has no consequences. It's the side of the highway. It's like you know right it's, right. it's different. It's unfortunate. Well, it all flows back down to them eventually. Yeah, I know, but it impacts everybody yeah. else no, because they don't have, you know, they I'm won't not, conserve. I'm not trying to be a proponent of littering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's throw it in. It'll, it goes down to the bay. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we. it's funny, too, because we, the stuff that we pick up on our, our traps when we're out, I mean, hypodermics are a R- legitimate, the worst, huh? yeah, yeah, a that, legitimate holy concern. Smokes. Sure. And the cranksters, when... And I can still remember um, uh, the first experience I had with it out in a morning, you know, it's one of those mornings where you're like lucky. We're out on a raft um, tracking fish that had radio transmitters um, inserted into them. And it's, you know, six o'clock in the morning. It's quiet. It's still, it's out on the Stanislaus River. And I come around a, a corner and, you know, there's a fire with a 55 gallon drum cooking. And I'm like, what the oh my gosh i didn't think like right away (laughs) right and then there's nobody around and as we're going by that was the spookiest part is that you know there's people there right and they can see us and we have no idea where Where they they are are. wow um so yeah that's that's how people use our outdoors these days (laughs) you can't teach them anything no right (laughs) that's for sure so Matt, you said you were you fished the McLeod back in the day. I did, yeah. Did you ever hit the Conservancy? Yeah, lots of times. Got um, a trip trip planned in July. Oh yeah, did yeah. you you got your spot already? I do. Yep. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing that this year. Is that you have to wait till July for the snow melt to kind of, you know, you know uh, glacier it's, melt to calm it's, down or? No, it's kind of just a friend's trip. Oh cool. Um, trying to put together an annual trip for yeah. uh, Humboldt State alumni. Uh, from our old class so cool just trying to pick a date that actually works for us uh but yeah sometimes it can be muddy uh, with that higher water so the, um, you've said you fish the pit and the mcleod and the hat all those you like dry fly fishing those the most or you know what do you, what do you like to do you know what pr- pretty much I, i'm whatever works um yeah. typically nymphing um is what i do most of the time but um yeah, if, if there's opportunities to dry fly fish, I'll definitely do that. Is that but, the science tips behind you? You know that the fish eat 90% of the time subsurface, so that's Well, that, that, was, that was pre-scientist that I figured that one out. <laughs> um, but uh, no, one, one, one of my favorite ways to fish now, and it might not be the most effective, but just using a dry fly and a dropper. Yeah. Um, and that, you yep. know, kind of the best of both worlds for that. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed on how well that works in different different waterways like the north fork of the feather and places like that there's it's pretty neat to be able to fish fish it's like a hopper like a grasshopper pattern or stimulator anything that's kind of big and floaty yep yep yeah cool yeah i haven't done it yet but i'm planning to yeah super effective and you can fish you can fish all the all the water you typically don't get to you know if you have your your nymph rig and a big indicator and a bunch of split shot you typically can't fish the three foot slot on the side because you have too right. much weight on and you know, right. your just rigs too long or it's just too bulky. But if you can throw a dry and a dropper in there, it's just, do you guys maybe... do any work on that river, the North Fork of the feather? No, we no. don't No, Fished it a few times, but never yeah. you know, worked on it. Yeah. I went up there in the fall and it was like 72 degrees it's like <laughs> bath water on the, the, the river itself was. Yeah. Wow. It's just below Belden. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think some of those fish just adapt and can deal with that warm temperature, you know. They seek out. Um, you'll find them right yeah. in the head, right in the riffles, yeah. right where the oxygen is, and they're kind of just they, they have to be there, you know. Cause yeah. They'll... As long as it's not sustained periods of, of you know high water temps, they can head down into the gravel and they seek cold water pools. And there's 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 places where they can survive. We saw. Boy, with the drought, we were monitoring uh, rainbow trout populations in the, the Stanislaus River. Um, and go figure, we started in 2009 doing annual, because this is one of the things that kills us about steelhead, is we still, in, in the years that I've been doing this, we've learned very little about steelhead um, 
uh, life history or you know effective management and all the money goes to the salmon it does and they just assume well you know what if it's good for salmon it's good for steelhead too mm-hmm. and the key is i think it all goes back to steelhead are just really hard to to count because they don't die after spawning salmon you know the one index we have going way back um to 1952 i think is is annual salmon abundance because they they die so we can go out and collect them and, and count them but we still don't know much about um, about steelhead and we started counting um, rainbow trout populations um, summertime populations in the Stanislaus River a couple of tributaries in, including Chico Creek 2009 and that was right at the start of the drought so we we covered this drought period and watched uh, rainbow trout populations plummet by what Matt 80 84 uh, percent or something 80 85 yeah, yep. all due to high water temperatures. They, the, the drought um, drained uh, New Maloney's Reservoir, and that's the great thing about reservoirs is they do provide us the cold, cold water. water pool, yeah, right? Water. Yeah. Um, and the, but we got down to that warm water pool, and the last two years the, the trout population was just killed. It'll be interesting mm-hmm. now, and this is all done by private water rights holders. We hope to continue that monitoring for another five years, and if we have good conditions, it'll be interesting to see how quickly how fast it bounces back. Right? Yeah. It's a great. We were just so lucky the time we started monitoring this population, and it'll be really fascinating to see. I've seen that um, just firsthand on one of our local streams in the last uh, five eight years. You're talking about Butte Creek, Um, River X. Oh. But just from there's, fishing there's it, certain just yeah. from fishing it, he's cagey about. Just See, from right, yeah. just from <laughs> fishing it, um, I've noticed a huge drop in populations, yeah. and that's what made me ask you about the otters. Yeah. And we've gotten so emails from people um, the last couple of years about like what's happened to all the fish. So even the the public, the fishermen are getting it, right. and Fair I think enough. the key is probably staying above dams the next couple of years because um, below dams, I think the populations have been. Have been hammered. This is going to be a tough year above dams because of all the snow melt. I think right. The flows are obviously going to be yeah. going to be high. I mean, the, the truck is like pumping at fifty five hundred right now, <laughs> just yeah. ripping. Yeah. And then the little truck is at like fifteen hundred today, which is it's normally like at one twenty or something like that. So they're they're getting a lot of a lot of runoff right now. Yeah, it's funny that last couple of years we've had research planned that was canceled because of low water conditions and the drought. And this year it's the opposite. We've got research um, that was scheduled that was was canceled because of the high flows. <laughs> so it's so more extreme. So your guys' together. tip for uh, any angler listening is to fish above the above any dam at this point until mm-hmm. until the populations can bounce. You back. know what's the main stem Sacramento? That's probably cool, right? Oh yeah, no, yeah. Well, yeah. because it's managed the main for winter. Dude, they're, they're, oh, they're, yeah, they're getting doubles at twenty twenty thousand CFS yeah. on the lower sack. So yeah, the, um, during the drought, the water temperature had, would skyrocket compared to what it's normally running at but it's still it's still cold, pretty cold water fishery yeah, yeah I'm, I'm the the upper sack's almost in shape now it's it's getting close and and um i have a feeling it might be pretty good this year what's river x anyway uh, we should probably know that as as professionals it's important for us to know these details <laughs> <laughs> river x is the name of a river that you don't want your yeah. buddy to know about <laughs> we hear, you know that's funny being a fish biologist too the question the worst thing about being a fish biologist is everybody's an expert at your field at your chosen field you know you can't have a drink in a bar without somebody telling you your business oh yeah i, um, bet. Oh, I bet especially with old timers they're like no that's you're not that's they'll not ask right. your opinion and then they'll no tell offense, you why you're wrong grandpa. based on their own personal <laughs> experience Everybody's and the massive an amount of data that they've come through have you ever met an angler that wasn't like a know-it-all <laughs> that's what i was saying that with fly fishing the opinion is Base, it's pretty close to fact. Yeah, that's totally, <laughs> you know, when you're passionate about something, this is the way it is. Yeah. So, do you guys have an entomologist on staff, or do you sub that out? Typically, sub that out. Yeah, we don't have one on staff. Yeah, we're uh, we want to talk to one. G- Chico State has a good entomology yep. laboratory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Joe, Joe Sluzark, we'll All get right. him in here. Cool. So, what, what was the organization you were talking about? Um, the the well, we just do yeah. i think yeah we do you know one of the neat things that we get to do um is um, a lot of 
type of give back programs or community oh, give, programs. Right. right. Um, and well, we were talking earlier about Steelhead and how we don't have any information on Steelhead. And one of our beliefs has always been, well, if it's too hard to do research on Steelhead, maybe you should study rainbow trout and which should you be able to infer a lot of information on, on Steelhead. Knowing the summer abundance of resident rainbow trout throughout the Central Valley, for instance, would give you a baseline of trout populations state of California, and we've tried to get people to, to look at that, um, the, both the state and the federal governments, and, you know, nobody just wants to, to support that, that baseline research. And we actually started a couple of years ago, um, you know, we opened our first office in Chico and thought, well, you know, community give back program, let's get some of our guys up here in the summertime and we'll use it as a training program and count the number of rainbow trout that are in, the, in Chico Creek. Mm-hmm perfect you know it's like it's just perfect for chico and i think it was after our our first year or know, during the first year or the second year one day i got a call from federal game warden and said you know you got a permit i hear you're out snorkeling the river counting rainbow trout like, yeah that's kind of what we do you have a a permit for that work like and this has always been kind of a gray area in fisheries. Do you need a permit to, you know, to count fish? Um, will we try and be stealthy? We're floating downstream or, or you know, slowly um, crawling upstream to, to count fish. And this is Chico, right, where we've got spring run that hold in pools where people swim and right. inner tube right. and drink beer and party. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, we're, we've got three scientists at a time. Um, snorkeling Chico Creek, what could you, what, who would possibly have a problem with that? And we were actually threatened with jail. Um, wow. And so we had to stop that, that community get back program, unfortunately. That's amazing because you being out there, you're going to see maybe somebody trying to snag a salmon or do something wrong. I mean, you know, so just like an angler or fisherman yeah. that is doing something, trying to do something right. There's, you, know, like, you know, I think there's a couple of things going on. We're always been at odds. You know, we're private consultants and, and fishing game, you know, they just, they don't like that. Number one, it's kind of an intruding on their, their territory. A lot of times we're just on opposite sides of the table, um, just naturally kind of how the system works. Um, but at times like this, you're just like, you know, we're, this is baseline information and this is what we do. And, you know, we're out here to give back to the community and protect this resource and, and give everybody some, some knowledge. First year we did it, you know, we put a report out and put it online and um, it was well received by the community. Um, I think it was the second year we got shut down. And then ironically we're back doing it again and uh, matt refresh my memory how was it that we got back into the snorkeling chico creek how did we do that well we got our permits <laughs> <laughs> first things first we but got wasn't our it chico state year. it was chico state chico yes. state got a permit so they have these students there that don't have any experience um right and they're clueless they, they get a permit to do it so they come to us to ask us how to do it <laughs> the are they people going that down got to shut ecological down. preserve and doing their uh, studies uh, out of there basically yeah or? so um we we did take a class out um and they did not have a lot of experience and so we, we could swim uh, though I assume. uh some of them <laughs> 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 and so uh we we did take the opportunity to to team with that class and um a few of us from the chico office actually went out and um, showed them the basics of the gear, um, how you might go out and um, kind of do the habitat typing that we do, how to ID fish. Is there electro shocking in, no, involved? Uh, no, 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 no electro um, fishing um, for this particular project. What's an, the nice thing about snorkeling is that you can actually get in the water um, and not handle the fish. Right. Um, and so that's really important for a lot of the sensitive species we have sure. uh, in California. Or so, fragile fisheries like Chico Creek. It, exactly. Which, yeah. um, and so that it's a it's a um uh you know you don't expect any lethal take from you know snorkeling through a through a riffle or a pool so it's a it's a really good method to do that um and so we um did a couple days with the class um we taught them how to snorkel how to be safe in the water how to wade across safely um fish id i mentioned um and so that was kind of one field day and then uh, second field day, we actually went up to the ecological reserve with him mm -hmm. and um, uh, dove, I believe it was about a quarter mile um, section of water um, and got some counts with him and, and got him in the water and like, yep, this is how a field survey is. And about half of them made it. 
Um, the other half is still up there. <laughs> but uh, no, they just their bones. <laughs> they, they they were troopers. Um, uh, you know, some of the gear didn't quite fit, and they just uh you know trucked on through so well and the punchline is they kicked us off the water um because we didn't have a permit so and i can understand that we apply for a permit and then they denied our permit and you know we're doing this work for free again right. for the benefit of our the, staff but also the, the community. community yeah, yeah. it's and pretty then, nutty and that's you know that's kind of what we deal with um just throughout the it's a microcosm the, yeah, the, the politics of it, um, unfortunately, it's, it's just, you know, So there's still studies going on up there? Or? We're, we've done how many years of we Chico did, Creek now? We did, did we? 2013, 2014, and then uh, this will be our first year back. When um, are you guys doing it? It'll be probably July or August, depending on our scheduling. Yeah. Well, we did 16 too, right? We did last we, year. We did an abbreviated survey abbreviated. with the class. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's you got to pull teeth to, you know do research it's go figure um right. it's it's funding is always the challenge it's hard to get people to that have an interest and want to, to fund research but then when people step forward and want to do it on their own and then to, to be shut down it's just um it's kind of the way it goes well, that run days. of salmon that goes up there is on the endangered species list yeah. right that, no but uh, you got threatened yeah the threat threatened yeah. right <clears throat> you got tubers i mean you're right you've been up to bear hole oh, yeah. brown's hole so you guys that's where you did the surveys right through there? Yeah, through uh, downstream. Uh, of we that and we did uh, we did from the lower end of the ecological reserve up to Higgins Hole. Yep. which is the upper end of Anatomy yeah. for Big Chico Creek. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So how what were the numbers like and what was the size, all that stuff? Uh, you know, the first year I think we were about twenty five hundred fish on the ecological reserve. Those and then were, how many river miles was that? Roughly? That was about um, three and a half, four and a half. So that's so fair. A, I mean, fairly low numbers. Um, yeah. In 2014, we actually did note a pretty good decline in the numbers of fish. Um, and water temperatures, again, were, you know, common story. Every stream kind right. of experiences it. Right. Water temperatures looked like they were quite a bit higher, and there was a lot less fish um, were they, in 2014. Were they on the younger side, older side? Uh, typically older side. And and to your point earlier, a lot of them were, were in the cooler sections. Uh, you know, they had either moved up. Um, right. to find that colder water yep. or they were in different types of habitat. But like Chico you mentioned earlier. Creek is a heck of a little fishery and that's the key. And, you know, it's kind of got some hard access at points. Yeah, but it's I just think, the access is yeah. the top part. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's what makes a great trout stream. And, you know, there's a River X in the San Joaquin Basin as well <laughs> that people don't know about. It's underneath everyone's radar, the Calaveras River. Um, and I could say that now because unfortunately the, the trout population has plummeted due to due to the drought. But we're hoping that it recovers or rebounds quickly. But it's one of those streams, only 157,000 acre feet of runoff in an average year, and only 300,000 acre feet of cold water pool storage upstream. So and what's the significance of those? those two data points because it's such a small stream and right. you know we think of blue ribbon trout fisheries as being below shasta or new maloney's so got what's the huge... stanislaus like what what's that runoff in comparison what is that, that one point well uh, the runoffs of storage average is... annual is about 1.0 uh, million and the storage is 2.2 million okay yeah. In that reservoir. so yeah substantially smaller in yeah. right so yeah. it's it's tiny and in the in the winter time um, without storms, I mean, it could be 15 CFS at times. You mm -hmm. could, you know, it's just a tiny stream. But in the wintertime, temperatures are cool, um, so the fish populations do well. They can handle small space as long as they've got cool temperatures. If you give them hot temperatures in small space, there's a lot of competitive interactions that are going on. It's stressful for them, and you get a, a lot of mortality. The summertime, Those otters are getting in there and eating. And that's where I saw. Go. That's actually <laughs> where I saw the otter. With He's held on just, just wiping out all otters. Yeah, right. Do you Personal get that vendetta on yeah. otters? Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry to interrupt. In this, so in the summertime, <laughs> the temperatures are actually up because they're yeah. using the cold water. They're using the reservoir storage for irrigation and for right. the city of Stockton supply. Um, so you get higher flows in the summertime, kind of inverse of what you what you typically expect hmm. but that um, blue ribbon trout fishery has all occurred due to the building of um, the construction of new hogan reservoir um, back i think it was in the in the 50s 
Um, there's trout in the upper basin, but there wasn't, there is not a population. Fishing game doesn't even bother stocking the upper Calaveras Basin. It's, you know, they've considered it's got that little value for put and take fishery. But now currently below um, New Hogan, it's just, it's a fantastic fishery. And it just goes to show you don't need a lot of water. What you need is good quality habitat. And the key, and this is in the research that, that Matt's been doing the last um, five or six years in San Joaquin Basin, Number one key, I believe, I've always believed, is is gradient. Um, when you get good gradient, you get high abundance of, of rainbow trout. Because what gradient means Riffles is, and oxygen. And right, diversity. Current, yeah, you get current, total yeah, habitat bugs diversity. And, so for, yeah. for me, because you know, I'm new to this game, uh, you're talking about the slope of the river? Yep. Okay. Yep. You want to find a high gradient stretch. You know, the canyon reaches. The water travels through fast. So it doesn't have a chance to warm up. Um, you get small habitat units, and what you find with rainbow trout is um, when you get visual isolation, you can get more fish, a, pop, a higher population or a higher number of fish in a small habitat than if you have a large habitat that's, that's wide open. So you get the, the feeding stations, the visual isolation, you know, they're not as competitive, um, and that's what you find in those, those, those higher gradient um, canyon reaches hmm. um, that's interesting and, yeah calaveras um just and then we we think we have more, a higher um incidence of steelhead or of anatomy in the calaveras river as well because it's not connected to the delta and the ocean year round so that what makes the calaveras river different from every other central valley not every other but most central valley rivers is it doesn't connect year round so you don't have the population of warm water non-native fish in the lower stretches and you know when you think about it if you're a rainbow trout when do you decide you want to be a steelhead and you move downstream chances are you're going to be eaten you're not going to survive so we've been artificially selecting for resident rainbow trout as opposed to anadromous steelhead for you know for decades due to great great conditions below dams due to the cold water but also um, what drives water temperature in the central valley um, without a doubt is air temperature and you get to the summertime and you can't put enough water down a central valley stream to keep it cold enough for trout um, and salmon in the lower reaches so the non-natives move in they're established year-round and so you get the predation problem so anything that wants to be a steelhead i think is probably probably eaten wow it's very interesting that's good stuff because i i think that at, le at least locally what i've experienced those fish are moving quite a bit like you were talking about they're they're finding that colder water and they'll, they'll you don't think of a trout as moving up miles or down miles yeah. of river but I mean, nature kind of finds a way, and they, they almost need to do yeah, something like, how, like that. Yeah, like how transient are these are these fish? I don't know. That's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, nice. I don't know if I have a good answer for that, yeah. but I mean, they definitely. Did I, did I stump you, man? Uh, <laughs> potentially. I mean, I'm just thinking of uh, some recent telemetry work on in, in the delta. Yeah. Um, so it's not related to trout, but related to catfish, bass, and striped bass, and it looked like from some of the uh, studies uh, that NOAA Fisheries had done in the San Joaquin River. Um, looked like largemouth bass tended to stick around the location they were um, tagged at. Um, catfish moved a little bit more than the largemouth bass, it, it appeared. And then, um, as you can imagine, striped bass, highly mobile, migratory right. fish all over the place. Yeah, we've um, seen picture proof of that with the guy catching like a 40 pounder up in, you know, the upper sack up by Red Bluff, and then that same fish with the same scar was caught miles and miles downriver. You know, yeah, that kind of yeah. that that kind of opens up another question for me. So, do you guys cull social media for any sort of data right now? So, you know, just basically like Instagram hashtags. If you if you hashtag a lower sack, I think you're getting trout. ahead of them, like with AI. You need an AI, an <laughs> algorithm AI. <laughs> no, no, we, we we haven't done that yet. No. Sounds like it. Yeah, it sounds like futuristic AI I'm stuff. A, I'm a dork, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, about stuff like that. I do think there's definitely some possibilities in the future with with anglers, and that was one of the things years ago we had promoted. Um, especially high, you know, high, my passion is high mountain trout, um, um, getting up in the high elevations, which. We fishing game used to have a program, um, kind of a limited monitoring program. But when you can't get money to study salmon and steelhead and delta smelt in the Central Valley, it's really hard for somebody to put up ten million dollars to study, you know, 
high mountain trout, but certainly at least using anglers to look at distribution, you know, presence, absence of fish definitely has value. Um, it's one of those things that could easily be done with, you know, with an app these days. Yeah, yeah I was going to say with, methodology. with yeah. an app, exactly. Right. Like, I mean, if you could, if you could just, you're talking about spreading that money out over a period of time. And if you could it, not pay somebody, but whatever yeah. you have to do to get them to give you your data, that could go a long way. The future of way. fisheries research, man. I yeah. mean, that's kind of it, you know, using the public to do it. Right. Yeah, no, it's it obviously makes... it's kind of limited in the data that you can collect, but there's certainly certainly value in presence and absence. Yeah. Hmm. Well, a good example of that is bird counts that are typically done by Audubon yeah, Society. Yeah. I mean, that, right. uh, there's been a lot of good work citizen science yeah that there's an app that the yeah they'll they'll track a bird that's not that was just (laughs) it was over on the after bay they tracked this bird that wasn't supposed to be there it was a i think it was a duck and um all these people came from all over the place to watch it and they're oh my god you know get their binoculars out and the thing flew up let me guess somebody shot it somebody shot it (laughs) (laughs) somebody blasted it out of the air and and jumped back in their truck and and took off and you know it just wasn't supposed to be here but because norcal but because of that (laughs) app that you know they were they were able to track it over here it's pretty neat that's a good point (laughs) (laughs) you guys didn't hear about that no oh it was in local it was in the local news everybody was laughing kind of laughing about it so Hmm. anything else I don't think so. It was all, it was, yeah, good stuff. Do San Joaquin River restoration programs. So you have one more thing to throw in there? Yeah, yeah. let's go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's always a good story. The San Joaquin uh, restoration? Uh, yeah. Yeah, tell us about the San Joaquin Is Are you talking about like the McCollamy and like all those different well, you know, it's, arms? Well, you know, it's kind of frustrating how, how money gets spent. Um, um, you know, it's the politics of the situation because – uh, salmon, you know, we the I don't know how many years ago this this was a uh, court battle that was fought out for fifteen or twenty years, and about five years ago, it was about a billion dollars that was earmarked um, for the San Joaquin rest what they call a San Joaquin restoration program. And that's bringing back spring run salmon to um, the San Joaquin River below Friant Dam. And the, the spring run salmon had been extirpated or extinct since they built the dam. They're one of those species that you know, they needed to ac- they need to access the, the colder water pools in the upper river. So once they built the dam, um, they couldn't do that. They went extinct. And rather than, um, I think, take a more manageable task, um, the government decided, you know, oh, it's worth a billion dollars to, dry, to try and bring Spring Run back to um, the San Joaquin. And we're talking about the southern extent of, of salmon in the entire world. So you couldn't find, the way I look at this is like, you couldn't find a bigger challenge or a more difficult place to bring, you know, right. if you want to restore a population, you couldn't find a more difficult one. And when you look at all the issues that we have in the Central Valley and all the challenges we have um, to think and, you know, when you look at the San Joaquin River, we're talking about 150 extra river miles. Um, we try and get 15 or 20,000 salmon back to the Tuolumne River. And to think that we're going to get fish back 150 miles further south. And that's 150 miles that we're currently dewatered. And through the, this lawsuit settlement, they, they got flows, a little bit of flow to restore the um, river channel to make it wet year round. And then they were going to bring in hatchery fish and, and, and try and restore that run. And I don't know that in the last couple of years we've had <laughs> any luck doing it. And we were talking about this the other day. Just it's so frustrating. You can't get money to just, you know, to do to sample fish populations in northern California or to do research in the Delta, but then the government goes out and spends earmarks a, a billion dollars to bring back fish to... To the, the desert. Right? It's... Just, it's just, what are we What are we thinking? Um, hmm. And I'm not one for giving up on fish populations or the environment, but in this day and age, you got to be prudent, especially when yeah. you have limited resources. Right. you got to be, you know, smart about... And the key is conservation and yeah. things you're, you know, you're mentioning. Everybody's you always must bang for your buck, for Christ's sakes. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like you think of all the water rights you could have bought, or all the habitat you could have bought, um, all the good things you could do with a billion dollars um, in Northern California, and instead we go to Southern San Joaquin Valley and 
try and restore fish populations there. And I think it's just one of those things that, I don't know, am I overstating it? Is it doomed to failure? Well, I wouldn't say that. It's uh, they got a tough road ahead. It's doomed to failure. <laughs> yeah, especially when you've got, you know, if you look at your, your point about the licenses earlier, if you're looking at people that are buying those licenses, I would argue that most of them are going to be probably above the bay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I would invest the money in the base that's well, actually that's driving a good point revenue. too and here's here's the idiocy of 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 trying to do this we had last year and the stanislaus um we know a lot about we do a lot of work in the san joaquin basin so we're, it's kind of um, passion that's where i grew up in the upper sacramento or the upper stanislaus tuolumne basins um fishing up there um in the, the high mountains um the we had almost what 15 20,000 fish come back to the Stanislaus salmon come back to the Stanislaus about what was 15, the number yeah. 15,000 fish come back to the Stanislaus river and it still was it open for fishing this for year for 2016 yeah that was yeah yeah what's and the average return last couple of years it's been really it's been poor right. three four five thousand fish um well, I shouldn't say that because the 15 was high too 14 and 15 were high 13, 14, 15 were high yeah. uh, before that. It's fairly low. Yeah. But the habitat has capacity for about three to 4,000 adult salmon. Right. And that's the key, what you just mentioned. That's the key. Right? The capacity so, of what it's able and to consistent. We know. We've, this is proven, without a doubt, is when you get more spawners over that capacity, you're actually decreasing the number of babies that you're producing. And the government, their, their doubling hmm. goal is what 19 20 20 000 fish so the government has a goal they want more fish in the stanislaus river than they have habitat for in fact they want so many fish that it's actually detrimental to the population more fish is going to produce fewer babies which is asinine and so you know we've been telling the last couple of years well open up fishing why would you not open up fishing you, you're getting more fish back to this river than you have capacity for right why would you not open up fishing and let people come in because you know when people fish the public goes crazy they love to catch a salmon the kids are out there it's such yeah. a big deal for them and that's what gets them interested in conservation and what makes this even more asinine is that the fish that were coming back were all hatchery fish um, mm -hmm. and we've been arguing on the stanislaus river for instance you know we don't want hatchery fish we'd rather have few wild fish you know our key to protecting these populations long term would be having say three to four building more habitat so we can have more fish number one but if we've got the habitat for three or four thousand fish that should be our target and we should have three or four thousand wild fish rather than hatchery fish there's no hatchery on the stanislaus river yet we've been estimating the last couple of years we're getting 98 99 100 percent hatchery fish back to the system why because fish and games releasing 30 or 40 million juveniles out in the bay and so when they release them out in the bay, they don't properly imprint. So when they come back from the ocean, they're just randomly going they, they don't wherever. Come, they don't go from whence they came. They just kind of go yep. wherever. Okay. Yep. So when, when, you know, in Alaska, they allow snagging of, of salmon in certain, certain, you know, waterways. So is that for that, that issue? If, if it's overpopulated, that it, it hurts the, the spawning? It can. Um, I think. I think what Alaska does um, is that they try to limit the interactions between wild fish and hatchery fish, and so um, by allowing intense fishing or snagging in certain cases, mm -hmm. I've seen it mm -hmm. um, in Homer. Um, <laughs> anyways, they they minimize those interactions between wild and hatchery fish. So, and 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 that's a way to kind of maintain the wild fish populations a little bit better. And it is in. They want to limit the interaction. Is it because the, the, the ones that come into the ecosystem push the other ones out? or is it Typically, hatchery fish perform. Displaces them. It, it, it can dis displace them. There's, there's a lot of evidence just in all sorts of different um, fish species. When you have hatchery fish, they generally perform poorer than their wild counterparts in the same environment um, in terms of you know producing more fish the next generation, mm -hmm. surviving um in the ocean and there's there's a lot of evidence to point to why hatchery fish aren't as you know and so good go, as wild fish go in, figure in what are we doing in california cases? we've got a totally a hatchery system going and it's one of those things that it's not promoted and and you got to kind of be on the inside to recognize what's going on but 
you know, our thing is always, you know, it seems to be a better long-term strategy, especially with climate change, which is definitely occurring, to um, have fewer naturally produced fish than a larger mass number of hatchery fish, especially if you're getting more hatchery fish back than you have the capacity to support. We don't have goals in California for salmon escapement. Escapement is the number of fish that escape the ocean, sport and commercial fishery, escape the um, river fishery, the number of fish that actually spawn. Um, Those goals are higher um, throughout the Central Valley than we have habitat to support. So so it sounds like for these government programs, um, the problem might be how they're measuring success. Yeah. And that's driving well, I feel the policy like, decisions, right? I feel like yeah. I need to thank you guys now because uh, the lack of data that's been gathered over the last 50 years is changing now, and but yet nothing's catching up to what needs to be done for people to get back into fishing, right. to get yeah. the fisheries back to where they should be. I mean, that, what you guys are doing now is going to provide all that movement, I think, here in the future. Hopefully, you know, you can only wish for it, but... Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's pretty cool. That's a great point. Yeah, you politics are slow to change. Um, right. Unfortunately, we yeah. collect great data, but um, and I don't know is it the politicians or is it the scientists that are the problem? <laughs> 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 is that where lobbyists come into play? Or? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, we started this 25 years ago. We didn't think I'd be dealing with lobbyists, but you're right on. <laughs> wow. Wow. Good stuff, guys. Well, thanks a lot for coming in and talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. How time. can how can the listeners learn about you guys? We heard the website. Uh, you on, are you guys on Facebook and um, Instagram? Yeah. Yes, Google. we are. Yep. Google Fish Bio, fishbio.com, YouTube. Lots of cool videos. You know, video production is something we've gotten into um, a couple of years ago. So yeah, um, they have a ton of great content. Yeah, guys. So. Yeah, we try and bring what we do home to the people. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, th- so thanks for joining us. Yeah, it was fun. All right, Appreciate thanks, it. guys. Thank you. Let's get out and wet a line. Yeah. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Bill. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.build.